Israel has a reputation for freeing hostages. It's a reputation they've built up over decades with some extraordinarily daring rescues. But this time, it's different. As Hamas militants rampaged across southern Israel, killing 1,400 people, they also captured almost 250 hostages. It was a core part of their strategy to give themselves a bargaining chip during the war they started. They're bargaining hard, demanding around 20 Palestinian prisoners be released in exchange for every hostage. Despite their reputation, Israel seems to be struggling to get the hostages out. I'm begging the world to bring my baby back home. I'm Matt Bevan, and this is If You're Listening. I want to welcome the Right Honourable Benjamin Netanyahu, the Prime Minister of the State of Israel. In Israel, there's a famous story. There's movies and books about it. It's told over and over at special events. Ladies and gentlemen. Like this one that Benjamin Netanyahu went to in 2016. This is a deeply moving day for me. It's like the Israeli Gallipoli. They're Waterloo, they're Gettysburg. We have gathered here to mark an event that inspired the world and lifted the spirits of my people. It's the day Israel rescued 102 hostages from the heart of Africa. International terrorism suffered a stinging defeat. And a legend was born. The rescue mission proved that good can prevail over evil, that hope can triumph over fear. And it's personal for Netanyahu, because it's also the day his brother died. I learned from my brother and from others the two ne things are needed above all to defeat terrorism. Clarity and courage. You see, the late 1960s and early 1970s were big for plane hijackings. There was very little security in airports, no x-ray machines. You could take liquids on the plane, nail scissors, a gun, even a bomb. A couple of sticks of dynamite sitting in the um, seat next to him. He told us right from the start that he meant business and he was going to blow us all up. Usually, when someone hijacked a plane, they were just trying to get into or out of communist Cuba. But the era of high-stakes political hijackings began in 1970, when Palestinian militants took four planes with Israelis on board. The hijacking in a single week of four jet airliners by one of the more extreme guerrilla organisations, the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. One plane was taken to Cairo, the other three to a runway in the middle of the Jordanian desert. The Palestinians claimed they'd blow up the planes with passengers on board if certain European governments and Israel refused to release Arab commandos held in their jails. After six days in the desert heat, the terrorist mans were met and the hostages released. Though the people were spared, the planes were not. $24 million reduced to ashes. Giving in to hijackers' demands was not something Israel was keen to turn into a habit. So when another plane full of Israelis was hijacked, they decided to do something about it. It was 1972 and Palestinian militants had taken control of a plane. They landed at Tel Aviv airport and demanded the release of 315 Palestinian prisoners who were being held in Israeli jails. After 24 hours of negotiations, the Israeli government appeared to give in. They told the hijackers they'd concede to their demands and bring the prisoners to the airport, and they could use the plane to fly everyone off to Egypt. The hijackers were delighted. They were so happy, they cracked open the plane's emergency doors a little bit to let in a breeze. But the Israelis said they'd have to fix the plane before it could take off, because the tyres were flat because the Israelis had punctured them. 16 mechanics in white overalls approached the plane in baggage carts. Among the mechanics were two future Israeli prime ministers, Ehud Barak and Benjamin Netanyahu. Sorry, to be clear, the men weren't actually mechanics. They were special forces soldiers, and in their toolboxes were guns. Watching from the sidelines was Netanyahu's older brother Yoni, also a commando. Commander Barak had refused to let both brothers join the operation in case both were killed. The mechanics arrived at the plane and, I don't know, donked the side of it with hammers and spanners a bit before pulling their guns out and ripping open the emergency doors. 
Netanyahu pounced on one of the militants and demanded she tell him where the bomb was. There was a scuffle. People started shooting. Netanyahu was hit in the arm. Two hijackers and one hostage were killed. In a matter of seconds, it was all over. The hostages were released. The story of Bibi Netanyahu's daring rescue mission became famous and a part of his personal mythology. But an even more famous and far more dangerous mission, the one spoken on in reverent tones to this day, was yet to come. And now the big one. See, four years later, Israel was put to the test again. And it was Yoni Netanyahu's turn to go. This time, the hijacked plane wasn't in Israel. It wasn't even in the Middle East. We were really at the ends of the earth. We could have been on the moon. The Air France plane took off from Tel Aviv and was supposed to land in Paris. Instead, the hijackers diverted the plane mid-air. Cynthia Zager and 250 hostages were taken to the old terminal at Uganda's International Airport on the shore of Lake Victoria. If you look at a map, you realise that even if you escaped from that building, where would you go? The plane had been hijacked by Palestinian and German extremists. But the hostages were now under the control of someone even scarier. They're now the virtual hostages of the Ugandan president, Idi Amin. Yes, Idi Amin, the brutal dictator of Uganda the world's favourite evil buffoon. Idi Amin made no secret of his hatred of Israel. But is it true that you said that Hitler didn't kill enough Jews during the war? <laughs> and of his support for the Palestinian cause. <laughs> the year before the hijacking, Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat had served as best man at one of Amin's weddings. When Idi Amin found out about the plane, he saw an incredible opportunity to get a bit of international attention. He came every day with a television crew, with a radio crew. The non-Israeli passengers were released, leaving 103 passengers and crew still in the terminal building. There was terror constantly. We were always surrounded by men with guns, men with grenades. We also were surrounded outside the building by the Ugandan army with heavy arms, with bazookas, with machine guns. The terrorist demands were the same as last time, releasing Palestinian prisoners. In Israel, the families of the hostages protested outside government offices to demand the trade. The Israeli government's understood to be under heavy pressure from Jews with relatives being held in Uganda. Earlier, there'd been emotional scenes when some of the relatives marched on the cabinet building to plead for the lives of the hostages. Yoni Netanyahu, by this stage, was a battle-hardened and highly decorated soldier, a veteran of three wars and several special ops. He was put in charge of a rescue operation that was so insane that the terrorists never imagined it was possible. The main problem was to get to the terrorists with the biggest surprise possible. We used several tricks to do that. The hijackers had been holding the hostages for a week when finally the operation began. On July 4th, 1976, Israel launched the most daring rescue mission of all time to save our captive brethren in the heart of Africa. Israeli planes flew at an altitude of less than 30 metres for thousands of kilometres before approaching Uganda over Lake Victoria. They landed in the dead of night in a country led by a brutal dictator who gave refuge to terrorists. When the plane landed, the commandos rolled out in a black Mercedes, identical to Idi Amin's car, flanked by Land Rovers. They were dressed in Ugandan army uniforms. The Ugandan soldiers, thinking it was their terrifying president, let the cars approach the terminal. It took less than an hour. The commandos burst out of the car and blasted their way through the airport, killing seven hijackers and 45 Ugandans. Most of them did not understand, until the last moment, what really happened. They blew up 11 fighter jets to make sure they could escape safely. Three hostages were killed, and also... A senior Israeli officer was killed, shot in the back. My beloved brother Yoni, who led the force that stormed the old terminal, overcame the terrorists and freed the hostages, was the only soldier who was killed. The operation immediately became legendary. When the hostages returned home, there were parties in the street. 
It was retroactively renamed Operation Yonatan in Netanyahu's memory. By the end of the year, production had begun on eight separate movies about the raid. Warner Brothers' Victory at Entebbe, starring Burt Lancaster, Elizabeth Taylor and Kirk Douglas, will premiere in Sydney in a few days' time. The movie starred Richard Dreyfus as Yoni Netanyahu. We've got the terrorists! Start moving the hostages out! There have since been questions raised about Netanyahu's actions leading up to and during the raid, with some reports suggesting that he was on the verge of being relieved of command just beforehand. But that's not the narrative spread by the Netanyahu family. Benjamin Netanyahu became internationally famous appearing regularly on American television to talk about his brother. And I think he drew inspiration from the Bible, from the biblical heroes. Benjamin Netanyahu is the brother of the fallen Jonathan, and he is now A, ambassador from Israel to the United Nations, and B, the editor of the new book called Terrorism, How the West Can Win. Books have been written about Yoni Netanyahu including the publication of his private letters. This is a book uh, that our guest has written, uh, the letters of Jonathan, uh, his brother, Netanyahu, a self-portrait of a, of a hero. This is something you might enjoy reading. Around the world, military forces tried to replicate Israel's success in fighting against terrorists. They failed. In Iran, the mood is one of national delight at America's disastrous failure to bring home the hostages. But this only added to Israel's mystique the idea that they were the only ones up to the job. In the following decades, other successful, though admittedly less spectacular, hostage rescues solidified this image. And retaliatory attacks by Israel against Palestinian targets sent a clear message. If you take Israelis hostage, we'll get them back and then we'll kill you. People ask for revenge. We are determined to settle the account. Now Israel's reputation is being put to the test. Hamas has 239 hostages being held in their vast network of tunnels dug into the soft sandstone under the suburbs of Gaza. Hamas claims the tunnels are more than 500 kilometres long. There's so many hostages in so many different places that Hamas took a while to figure out how many they had. Hopes of a rescue operation are slim. At least in previous operations, they knew where the hostages were. This time, they're spread across Gaza. So option B is a trade. The hostages' families are pleading with Benjamin Netanyahu to get their loved ones back. I'm begging the world to bring my baby back home. The families are desperate. Some are mourning the death of loved ones while they hope for the release of others. The family is broken. Their father, Sahi, is being held hostage in Gaza. Their 18-year-old sister, Mayan, is dead. Hamas says that they are willing to do a trade. Hamas declared this, that they are ready for immediate exchange so that all civilians, Israeli civilians, will come home and uh, in exchange for Palestinian prisoners being released. I think that's fair. But it's expected that to get them all released, it will take a massive release of Palestinian prisoners, potentially thousands. In 2011, Israel had to release a thousand prisoners in exchange for one single soldier who was being held hostage in Gaza. So far, Hamas has only released four hostages, two Americans and two Israeli grandmothers. 85-year-old Israeli grandmothers Yochevet Lifshitz and 79-year-old Nurit Cooper are given treats and tea before being released. One reaches her hand out to her armed guard and says salam, which is Arabic for peace. One Israeli soldier who was being held hostage in Gaza has been rescued. The families of the other 239 hostages have asked Netanyahu to trade all 4,500 Palestinian prisoners for all 239 hostages in what they're calling an all-for-all deal. And we, the families, will not stop until everybody is back. Netanyahu says he's considering it, but he'll find it difficult to persuade his hard-right political allies that it's the right thing to do. The Israeli Defence Minister says an all-for-all -all deal is impossible and the only solution is for the Defence Force to destroy Hamas. 
Sometimes in Gaza, the living look like the dead. Israel said it hit more than 400 Hamas targets in 24 hours. Hamas says that Israeli bombings have already killed 50 hostages. The question is, will there be any hostages left alive by the time Hamas is defeated?